What's up, guys? Welcome to the Julius and Larry Show. We're going to teach you guys how to bench press. Let's go. Rest, like in a resting stance, and just raise your arms directly up. And you want the bar touching your hands from there, just like having your back flat. Because once you retract your back, it's going to elevate you anywhere from a quarter of an inch to an inch, depending on how big your back is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so like our arm length is probably roughly sim very similar, but because you're so much thicker than me. Yeah. Your rack height is like three holes up from mine. Absolutely. Yeah. Like the wrist bone touching, you're saying? Like, could you demonstrate? No. So I would think, I would, so I would just say, just lay down on the bench. You want the rack height to be where the bar can place comfortably in your hands without overextending. Exactly. If you have to protract yeah. to it's, unrack, yep. then mm -hmm. it's too high. Yeah. So you want to be retracted and then there's no movement of the scapula. Yeah. So, safety track. Mm -hmm. so uh, I would say probably go ahead and get in your, um, get in your normal bench stance, retract your shoulder blades, and then allow the bar, whatever, whatever height the bar is sitting comfortably in your hands. The first thing that I do whenever I set up on the bench is I place my feet and I figure out where I'm going to be placed at on the bench. So real quick, set up on the bench real quick. Okay. We'll, get, we'll go ahead and get your feet back. So yeah, your feet back. Always keep your feet behind your knees. We want to make sure for proper leg drive, we want to keep our feet behind our knees. And what I meant by finding your foot placement first, typically it's always by the base of the bench. So we want to kind of make sure that our feet are somewhere within three inches of the bottom of the bench, right? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to Typically, what I would do is I'm going to, real quick, Larry, drive yourself up the bench to, to, let your, to set your feet up, to kind of get that leg drive. So right here. Yep. Okay. Now push yourself down. There you go. Okay. We want to make sure our eyes are directly lined up underneath the bar. Eyes are lined up underneath the bar. Foot placement, again, we want to make sure our feet are positioned behind our knees. And as you can see, Larry, is already ha he already has his quads engaged. So using proper leg drive is going to start with your feet. Some people prefer having flat feet. Some people prefer on their, on their tiptoes. I'm a bencher. I prefer um, being on my toes, which is going to allow me to actually um, drive my, the mindset that you're going to drive your heels through the floor, but they're not really going to go through the floor, obviously. So in order to have proper leg drive, again, starting from the feet behind the knees, engaging the quads, keeping the core tight, Retracting your lats and making sure that everything is tight from your feet all the way to your head. And here's, here's, a, here's a tip right here, guys. Make sure the three points of contact are going to be your butt, your lats or your shoulders, and your head. That's very important. You see a lot of benchers where they raise their head up off the, up off the uh, bench whenever they are in the middle of benching, which is going to cause... Um, you to not be as tight. So we want to make sure that everything is pushing against the bench for the most leverage as possible. Let's talk about hand placement a little bit. Hand placement can vary. It just depends on whether you're dominant with your upper chest or your tricep dominant. I am tricep dominant. So my hand placement is a little closer. A great way to be able to gauge that is get into a push-up stance and where your hands are placed on the floor it's typically within an inch in or an inch out is the range where you need to have your hand placement on the bar. Larry is more, he's upper chest dominant, so his hand placement is going to be a lot wider. As you can see, what are you, he is ring finger or middle finger on the ring? Ring finger. Ring finger on the ring. So when we're talking about the descent of the bar, let's go ahead and pull it out the rack. As, as you can see right here, Larry has flat feet, which I prefer, toes on the ground. But he is tight from his feet. You see his quads are already flexing, core is braced, and his head is on the bench. Everything should be tight from toe all the way up to the head. And as we descend, go ahead and descend, we want to make sure we are retracting. We are loading up. And we are driving, starting with our feet. Drive with your feet. Making sure that all the energy is channeled from the feet, through the quads, through the core, exerting through the movement. I just do my setup slightly different. Okay. Um, the biggest difference being, well, of course, flat feet. Yeah. And when I set my scapula to get super tight, I need to uh, throw myself to the bar. 
Okay. Just like you do. Okay. And that's this is the only way I can really get a nice arc. Absolutely. Um, I can't do it any other way. For example, using the rack, I don't feel as tight. Yeah. Pulling myself to the bar and then anchoring myself into position that way is how I can get the biggest arch. Absolutely. Um, one thing we didn't touch yet is where are you bringing the bar on your body? So I like bring it right on the sternum, like right here, right yeah. below the man breast. <laughs> will, will YouTube flag that? I don't know if they will or not. Right below the man breast, right? Some people come down to the belly. I mean, to me, I think that's uh, when you're coming way down here, I think uh, a lot of times that just takes you out of your normal, um, out of your normal bench uh, technique. You don't want to come down too far. Uh, you want to just find that sweet spot between, you know, I'd say, two inches starting from your sternum. So about right here to um, about two inches starting from your sternum, I, I would say. What do you prefer to come down to? Up rather than. So right it's roughly right. sternum, maybe slightly lower. Slightly lower. Okay. Yeah, it's my upper abs, my upper two abs. See, I'm coming like right below the nipple line. The nipple line. Okay, yeah. slightly higher than so, me. Yeah, absolutely. I just feel I utilize um, more. Uh, it's the weight moves more fluently, and I'm I'm utilizing uh, the, the the motor units how I'm how I'm moving. I'm activating my my front delts, my chest, uh, my lats. Everything is activated when I'm doing this. Now down here. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not comfortable. I feel like every time I do that, that I'm just gonna like pull this AC or uh, something along the lines of, of, of shoulders, you know, so. Um, which, everything that we're saying, you have to like, I'm not saying take it like a grain of salt, but you have to find out yourself because a lot of this is not one size fits all. It's universal. So give or take, um, like we were talking about hand placement, could be an inch in or an inch out, or maybe an inch and a half out or an inch and a half in. It all depends, I've seen some of the best bench pressers on the planet, um, some have closer grip than, than, than mine, and mine is fairly close. And I've seen some where they're extremely wide. So it's just about, you know, finding what works for yourself. And it's, sometimes it can take time. It took me probably three years to really get my bench technique down from, you know, if you look at some of my earlier videos, my feet were shifting all over the place because, simple, I wasn't getting my feet behind my knees. Having your feet behind your knees helps get that proper leverage so when you actually drive, it keeps your feet positioned compared to having your feet out. You're more prone for your feet to slip out in front of, in, in, in underneath you, especially on competition day when, you know, um, the yeah, floor yeah, can be chalked up. And absolutely, your feet slipping about. Feet slipping out. So carpeted flooring is mm -hmm. a good point. Exactly. So we need to make sure that we are um, we that we have our feet behind our knees. Another thing is make sure that um, your elbows are tucked at a 45 degree angle. A lot of people, they bench like this, causes a lot of uh, congestion in this area. You see a lot of strains, AC strains, rotator strains, upper uh, pec strains. Um, and I think simply it's not about your hand placement, it's just where your elbows are placed. We want to make sure we drive at a 45 degree angle, just like I talked about NFL players, NFL linemen. When you see an NFL lineman, which I should be an NFL lineman playing for the Dallas Cowboys right now. I agree. Um, NFL linemen, they don't come from here they, don't, they never drive from there, they drive from here. So I feel like we're most explosive whenever our elbows are tucked at about a 45 degree angle and they don't flare out until the end of the rep. So I would say 75% is when we start to flare out. Kind of lock out, rotate, flare out, however you want to put it. Probably only one thing I'd like to go back okay. to is the handoff. So ideally you want a training partner, someone always hand you up on the bench. Yeah. Even when I'm taking a plate, two plates, I like to have someone hand me off because I can't get into a really good position if I have to press out of the rack. So I'm protracting out of the rack because I feel when you're uh, getting, when you're pulling the bar out, you should really be pulling it, not pressing out of the rack. Absolutely. So you want your spot to do like, you know, a lot of the work as well. Well, and I bring it out to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense because if you're pressing out of the rack, you're placing the load at a point to where it's not a natural movement. So you're placing the heavy load up above your head and your body's not, Able, I mean, some people can do that, but I see most people that do that and they're pressing the, the weight out of the rack. Want, like you said, you lose tightness, but also the load is over your head and your body's not equipped to handle that load over your face like that. It needs to be brought down to your actually pressing position. Does that make sense? You can't stay tight if you are overextending like we talked about, if you're overextending to get the bar out of the rack. So uh, we talked a little bit about um, how do we find the rack height? 
So if you want to kind of explain that first a little bit, how you how, how did you find your rack height? Oh, go back to that. Sure. Okay. So this kind of ties in with not pressing out of the rack. Once I get into my position, right? If I have to press out to get the bar out of the rack, it's too high. Yeah. You know, I should be able to just pull the bar out comfortably. Come straight out. And when I'm ready to rack it, I shouldn't have to press it and re uh, protract my scapula to rack it. I should be able to pull it out from here and rack it without protracting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if it's too low, you're going to be doing too much work uh, pulling it out. You're almost doing like a quarter rep just to get into position. It's not ideal. So you want to be at that sweet spot where it's uh, like a notch below where you'd have to press it out. Absolutely. I think people don't realize uh, there's a significant amount of energy being burned when you are doing that quarter rep, especially when you're upwards towards 90 to 98% of your one rep max and having to, it's almost like a hitch. You see people kind of juggle the weight or they bring it out and it's too low and they press it up and then you start your, your, your set. Uh, Gagliano test to this is, is, uh, is if you do that in certain federations, they'll call it all day. I don't care if the rep flew, if it was the most perfect form. If you hitch or there's any imbalances on bringing the bar out of the rack, they'll call it from the get-go. So you have to be very careful on w where your rack height is. Um, I would say uh, the most, and it's hard because most people lift at commercial gyms, so yes. there's, a there's already a standard, it's already a set, it's already set, uh, whether it's midway or you know, uh, three-fourths of the way up of your normal uh, bench rack height. So. In which case, it's even more important to have someone to hand you yep. off. Have a spotter. If it's too low and you're yep. a commercial gym, you're a tall guy. Absolutely, absolutely. So what about when people are dumping the bar? So you see people on rack, they press, and then halfway up, it slips out of the hand. You know, maybe people are going thumbless, called suicide grip. Yeah. You know, so when you unrack it, are your wrists straight, slightly bent? No, you want, you want to make sure, so, in order to be proper, like to be able to handle the load correctly, we want to make sure our wrist is stacked over our forearm. It's got to be stacked in a line. That's why wrist wraps, you know, you, when you wrap them up, you want it to be tight so there is no movement, you know. I've seen people bench with their wrist rotated back, and uh, oftentimes that resorts in the bar rolling back on their face or their, on, on their neck. So you have to be very careful when it comes to um, how you grip the bar. When you grip the bar, you want to make sure you're squeezing it with your thumb wrapped around as tight as possible. It is not the same doing a suicide grip. Um, and you can actually tell in what your forearm looks like compared to gripping this way and gripping this way. It's just not, one is you're losing tightness also. Have you ever noticed anybody, um, well, I've tried it myself just to kind of get a feel for it and get an understanding, but anytime I've ever tried to do suicide grip, um, things aren't as tight as they should be. So I had, a, I had an issue, I get these weird, certain things in my technique started to break down. I don't know why, like my thumb would unwrap, when the weight was heavy, my thumb would just automatically unwrap from mid around rep. the bar. Yeah, mid rep. In the middle of the rep, my thumb, I got videos where you can see my thumb literally unwrapping off the, off the bar. I guess, I don't, we all do weird stuff when we're under load. Right. When, the, when the weight is uh, upwards towards a weight that we've never lifted before, or the sets or upper or sets that we've never had that capacity to lift before. So we do these little weird quirks or whatever you want to call it. That was mine. Mine was feet slipping or thumb unraveling from the bar, which would cause elbow, a lot of elbow tendonitis because when you're tight and then you relieve that when the load is, is placed on your elbow, when the load is placed and you have it in your hands, I mean, you're losing tightness. So something in here is, you know, your ligaments, everything is loosening up. So it just causes a lot of issues, and that's, I'm speaking solely for myself and for a few others that you know, we've talked about, um, making sure that you keep your thumb wrapped around the bar and you're squeezing as tight as possible. So you wanna- You're like bending the bar in half. Bending the bar in half. And I don't think like you can really bend the bar in half with suicide grip, because it's, it's almost like it's gonna slip out of your hands. It's almost a powerful muscle, you have to use it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I'm a thumb wrestling chicken. So, go right now? No, 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 no. I know you. We're not arm wrestling. We're not thumb wrestling. I know, I've already seen the videos, guy. But um, yeah, and these, like guys, I'm telling you, these are things that are going to save you. This going to save you from injury, help you to be a successful bench presser, and uh, stop you from being on Jim Fell videos. 
You know, <laughs> I'm being dead serious. Like, it's going to stop you from being on Jim Fell videos. Because if I, a lot of times, if I see you in there and you're doing something, I'm either say something to you or I'm going to have my phone out recording it because <laughs> I know something, something's about to happen. This is going to change depending on when your winter max bench is, right? Yeah, so if you're absolutely. Eight, you know, pound bench, you're almost going to be a bit different from if you're a 300 pound bencher. Uh, but generally, uh, I like to play, take plate jumps. Yeah. So I get to about like 80%. Yeah. And I'll take quarter jumps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about you? What do you recommend for the novice lifters? So for the novice lifters, I would say uh, five to ten percent jumps. Five to ten percent jumps is just something that's universal. That's uh, fairly easy. If you can't add, then uh, pull out your calculator and do it that way. But uh, this is like, and that's the thing. It's for some, it's so intimidating. They prefer not to do programming because it's so intimidating to them. But let me tell you what: implementing program into your protocols is going to be the best thing that you could ever do. So either implementing a program or having a coach. Some of the greatest athletes on the planet have had coaches. So that's one thing because a coach can tell you, a good coach is able to tell you when to dial it back or to turn it up because they're, they're looking from, a, from a, a bird's eye view or from the press box, right? From, so say we're on a football field and we're up in the press box and you have people up there calling the plays. That is what a coach is for. So guys, utilize a coach. Have somebody who's experienced, that, that's had people under their belt, that they've trained. Find a coach that's really passionate about you and passionate about training and that's not going to beat around the bush. That's going to tell you how it is, what it is, and when it is because, you know, you have a lot of coaches that co-sign for people just because they're their friends or they want the money, you know. So you have to be very careful when selecting a coach. But the biggest fault that I see in uh, competitors or everyday gym goers is not having direction in their programming. You have to have a program. You can't just go to the gym and be like, oh, today I'm going to lift 60-pound uh, dumbbells. I'm going to do those for about three sets because there's no way of tracking your progression. If you look back, I'm sure Gaglione can attest for uh, Larry is probably y'all can track from, heck, from seven years ago. That's the same thing with me and Josh. I can go back to my emails and see every single workout from 2015 till now and see that um, what, what we've done and what, we, what worked, what didn't work, and that's what's so important about being a world-class athlete. And if you don't want to be a world-class athlete, still, I advise you to get some kind of program because the whole point of the reason why we're lifting weights is to maximize our potential. Like, we want to be the best we can be. You know, that's what we're created is to, we're created to conquer and, and, and uh, manifest things that uh, inspire people around the world. So we have two world-class athletes, and that's solely, I feel, what our job is to do. Uh, upon reaching our goals is to inspire the world and show the world like what we're able to do and overcoming adversity because we've been through I'm, I'm sure you've been through the ringer I've been through the ringer and to show people that man life can get better man I appreciate it much love I think we covered just about everything from uh, child, from pregnancy to um, uh, childbirth. childbirth to uh, you know traveling to the moon so um, or Mars whichever one you want to whatever floats your boat but I appreciate you really. Hey, um, thanks for coming out to the city. All right. We'll see you in Bahrain for some huge dumbbells after you've gotten yep. your world record, like the what, third, fourth mm -hmm. time already? Mm -hmm. We're not going to Disney, baby. We're going to Dubai. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, I love that.